Um, in this lecture, we're going to be talking about cooperative management of community technology. Okay, let's uh, to get started on this. Um, I want to remind you of a few relevant subjects. The one that's really probably most relevant is the, the movies we watched on YouTube, Water by Ole. And the pump, the community technology in that case was a pump, a water pump. Okay? And you remember everything that happened with it, it had all kinds of problems. In the beginning, repair problems, reliability problems, lack of understanding who was going to maintain um, repaired pump. Who's going to pay for the repairs? All that stuff was going on. They fixed it all. The community, you know, with the community figured it out. And then, and then what happened? Well, they set up a committee. And then what was amazing is the student, since the, the community started cooperating on the pump, okay, they start cooperating on a lot of other stuff. And, and, and the whole community lifted itself up. It was a fascinating thing based on the technology, okay? So we're going to come back to this issue of. Uh, Managing community technology. The other one is relevant. Um, I didn't discuss too much, but um, it's in the book on in the section on participatory development, and that's on the subject of the management of common pool natural resources. Okay. So in that situation, you let's say a community has a forest next to it, and you go hunting in the forest, or you gather berries in the forest, and the community realizes that there will be a tragedy in the commons if they don't manage it. In other words, everything will be just devastated, and they'll have nothing. So they they control access, they come up with the committee, and they do this sort of thing. This sort of thing works in practice, in the real world, all over the world. People can manage a natural resource, okay, um, if they know what they're doing. Another relevant idea earlier on in the book is the notion of the common good from the Catholic um, social justice area. Um, the idea there was is everybody's supposed to contribute to the common good, things that are good for everybody, like healthcare, or education, or whatever it might be, and uh, according to their possibilities, is what they say, and then people can take from the common good too, and so there's sort of this shared, somebody might call it a shared bank, or but it, it's much more general than that, it's like a shared resources, it's social conditions is the word they use, so it's, it's a very general notion, but it's, it's, it applies to natural resources, it applies actually to technology. Okay, so now my resource I'm going to be talking about, I'm going to often call it a technology resource, okay? And I'm doing that in an analogy with some of these other ideas, like natural resources. So it's going to be a very basic question. Should people manage the technology, okay? Just like the water by the way, they manage the technology. Um, and, uh, or should technology manage the technology, okay? That is, should we automate the management of the technology? Okay, so we're going to examine that question today. Actually, I think it's a very complex question. I've talked to several people about this issue, and it's actually not clear what is best. And so that's the way I'm going to present this. I'm not presenting this today as like, you know, we have to use technology to do this, throw the people out. I'm not presenting that way at all. I'm trying to find a middle ground and ask the question, what would be good about letting technology manage technology? Okay? Um, versus it being back. So you can name these uh, systems uh, different things if you like. Um, so the community technology examples, some obvious ones are a water pump, an energy source like a biodigester, okay, a sanitation service like a set of toilets, or a cell phone charging station. So it's any technology that is shared. Okay, it's just that's the idea. In, in appropriate technology, often our concern this is a type of appropriate technology. Okay? But there's per remember, there's personal appropriate technology and there's community appropriate technology. So the personal side might be, well, for me, it might be a, a bicycle to charge you know, my cell phone okay? or uh, you know, some other a cook stove to cook me and my family dinner. Okay? Whereas these are meant to be used not just by one person, but by the whole community. One of these pumps is pretty expensive, actually. It's tens of thousands of dollars to get installed. It's, it's quite expensive, okay, because they drill down long ways, et cetera, okay. So there's uh, plenty of examples of, of community technologies. Um, and management usually means two things. Operation, so they it gives services or goods. So you know, services like charge or cell phone or goods like water, clean water. Um, and it has to be given an ad adequate quantity and quality, of course, like quality of water. And equitably, this equity among users is a challenging issue, okay? 
And um, so you might think of a pump, everybody goes to the pump, they pump the water out themselves, okay? Or should it be that somebody stands at the pump and helps them pump the water and charges them money? Why? Gotta maintain the pump, okay? Some money's gotta come from somewhere. It's natural to take from the user somehow, okay? Maintenance, well, you know, they need money for maintenance. So under heavy use, everybody knows technology breaks down. It, it, it's gonna happen. Engineers know it in a very technical way, in a very precise way, okay? Um, usually that's quantified by the concept called the mean time between failures. That's the engineering term, MTBF, okay? So whatever happens, it's gonna cost money. You're gonna have to repair it, you're gonna have to replace it, whatever it is, it's gonna cost money. So where does the money come from? So the pump works for six months, it breaks down. And your, your humanitarian engineering project is long gone. You're out, you're back in the US, you're fat and happy, and you know, you're home and sitting back, and their pump dies. What happens? So if you haven't set up a way to maintain this thing, you don't have long-term impact at all. This is a very challenging issue. So how do you get money from people who are making less than a dollar a day, for instance? Okay, this is a very challenging issue. Okay, and how do you know the pump even broke down? They're in the middle of nowhere. How do you know it broke down? That's a challenging issue. Okay, so an example here would be um, uh, looking at this diagrammatically. Is let's say we had three technology resources: a cell phone charging station, a water pump, and a set of toilets. And uh, you have five users, and the users. Uh, there's a lot of issues in this diagram. So, in some way, some of these um, resources can be used by more than one person at a time. Typically, a cell phone charging station like, might have 10 outlets, right? And you could, many people could chuck, plug in their, their phones. Uh, you know, but a toilet, one toilet per one person per one time. A water pump, one person per time, right? But what you can also, so, so you, you can have many people share some resources and, and they have to be take turns and others like lines or something. But there's another issue because what I'm gonna do, like, uh, I can do at home is I'm going to start my cell phone chargers and I'm going to go to the bathroom, right? I mean, you know how it works. I mean, you can do, you can use two resources at once. Okay, then the question becomes too, is it, well, do I charge for all this? Well, how much should it cost to go to the bathroom versus get a gallon of water versus charge your cell phone? Should I give away one of the service? So that I, I, I uh, get them using the system and I charge for something else. So for instance, I might give away the water, okay? Because water's a human right, period. But charge for the cell phone. But then the question is, is will the people say, ah, I'm charging too much, I'm gonna, I'm gonna charge the cell phone with my little hand crank or, you know, or something else. And then, or this one's really complicated, the toilet. Well, you know, if you charge for the toilet, you know the solution to that for somebody. Go out back, right? So the question becomes, especially culturally, this might be completely appropriate. So the question becomes here is, is what can you really charge and get away with? You may, may get away with nothing, okay? Now a system like this, this might sound unusual, but it's not. Every one of us use this system every day. What do we call it in the United States? What, what do we do? We have utility companies, right? They, pay, they charge us for electricity. We get our electric bill. What happens? Do you think my wife and I pay the electricity bill? Well, yeah, but what we did is we set up auto withdrawal. So in fact, what happens is once a month, it just pulls money out of our bank account, we keep getting paid. But if you think of it from a broad perspective, there's how many million people in the Columbus area that are doing this, right? And they're all paying for the community technology. It just happens to be a big electric power plant, while well, several of them around the state. You see that that is being done all the time. It happens with water in the United States. It happens with sanitation. We do this. We charge people for use, right? So what's wrong with doing it here? Well, it's more complicated in a certain way. Because look, in this situation, um, the people are making a lot less money. Now, if, if my wife and I don't pay the electric bill, what happens? 
So I'll give a little grace period, but boom, they shut it out. They shut it right off. This happens all over Columbus. They, especially in the poor communities, they get the electricity shut off, right? They get the phone shut off or whatever. And this, is, this is the way it works. But can you do that here? Okay, because, okay, may, they can get by without the cell phone. They can survive. They can survive without this. But what about this? Well, what does it mean? And maybe they can survive without it. But at the water viola, what does it mean? The ladies and the children got to start gathering water again. And they're going to start getting sick again. You know, the nasty wounds on them and all that stuff going on, man. This is nasty stuff. So there's serious, serious implications of shutting off a community technology service in these contexts. And yet, at the same time, so, you, so do you see there's a fundamental trade-off? So you need, you, you, you sort of want everybody to have access, but you also have to get the money. If you shut them down because they're not paying, they pay a serious price. So if you can extract the money from them, you can make sure the system's reliable and is there for a long period of time. You're gonna help them for a long period of time, right? This is this is really gonna get complicated in how to manage a system like this. This is a very, very difficult engineering problem because there's a lot, this is a socio-technological system. It's, it's very intimately coupled with human behavior and multiple humans' behavior. Okay. All right. Questions, comments? Okay. So let's start <coughs> um, studying this a bit. So I'm going to call these technology resources or community technologies or M of them. Um, there's N users. And then I get an amount of J for, for user I of RIJ of the resource. Uh, we have these possibilities of some things used. Then you have the issue, issue of continuous versus discrete use, because you can go to water pump and get any amount of water, a gallon, two gallons, anything in between, right? But you, you know, you use the bathroom once, okay? But you can charge your cell phone a, a continuous amount. You can say, oh, I don't have enough money for half charge, and just pay for half a charge, right? So, so there's a, these numbers here are gonna, they could work continuously or they could jump. Um, and then there's sequencing issues. What I mean by the sequencing issues is, is that a person, um, you don't know what their usage pattern is. So they could go to one technology and then the other and then this one and then swap the orders and then everybody's doing a different order. Okay, and that will affect the system. Okay, and then we don't know how, how much are the people going to get. I mean, how much water are they going to get? I mean, you can, engineers know roughly what it takes for a person water in water to live per day, but what are people really going to use? And then there's the issue of price. So what we're going to be doing is setting prices, PIJ, for the i person to use the J technology at time K. So these are going to be the prices that we'll have to agree on. Um, the user, there's a price, and then this is the, the amount. So the price times the amount is how much they pay, okay, to, to be able to um, get a certain RIJ amount at time K. Okay, so next. So you want to collect money to pay for operation maintenance. You might have to pay an attendant or a repair person, okay? Um, and then the question becomes <coughs> the really complex question actually, technological question, math question, etc. How much do you charge? I mean, how much do you charge? You say, oh, I'm going to charge a lot, so I got extra in the bank in case it fails a lot. Uh -uh, because the people don't want to be charged a lot. These people are hungry. So you say, well, I'm just going to charge a little. Uh -uh -uh, because then the pump's going to go down. You're not going to have money to pay for it. Or you're not going to have money to pay an attendant. If you have to pay, pay an attendant, okay. Uh, remember, this might cost a uh, dollar a day, right? To pay an attendant. We're not talking a lot of necessarily a lot of money. Or you don't even pay them with money. What you say is you can have much water as you want, just hang out here all day. I don't know if people would do that. Okay? Do they hang out all night? You know, somebody needs water in the middle of the night. Does the attendant have to sit out there all night? Or do you lock it down? Do you lock the toilet down? Do you, I mean, these are hard questions. Um, so you could, it's not clear what to collect, try to collect. You may try to collect more from one technology than another to pay for the whole system. That's also not clear. 
what approach to take. So let's talk about people doing this. So attendance, do you pay them in dollars or in use of the technologies? And the question is, is when will they work? Okay, because then when they're working, people can get the stuff, you know, a charge or a water or whatever. Um, and there's this lockdown issue, and it might help to have someone standing there because they could protect against theft or abuse, for instance, at a cell phone charging station. Okay, so the prices might be set by a community, like a committee that was set up at IOLA, right? That could happen. The problem is, is they're going to need some information from technical experts or themselves be a lot of experience about mean time between failure. How often does this pump fail? You know? And you understand what, why it's called mean time between failure. Because what generally happens with the technology, if you plot um, failures versus time, what's going to happen is, is that mean time between failures means there's a prob probably will increase like that it's going to fail. And there's a mean time that first failure, right? After you test thousands of pumps. And then there's the mean time between failures is the, the difference between that failure and the next one, and the next one, and the next one, right? And of course, this is these random variables. You don't know when the thing is gonna fail. You can get unlucky, you can fail fast. You get lucky, it can last for a year or more. You just don't know. But engineers often study, this is the kind of thing that engineers do all the time with products, right? They know, when, uh, well, for some technologies, they know very well like when it's going to fail. Usually, engineers are fantastic at predicting that, and then what happens is, is the lawyers come in and set the warranty such that you, you, war, the warranty ends on day whatever, and day whatever plus one, it fails, right? You know what I'm talking about, okay? This is what's going on, you know? There's no accident that that happens. It's, that's what happens. All right, um, then you have to store the money. Remember the problem in ILA, they had a, the, an issue there where <coughs> the, um, there was some corruption, remember, early on? And later on, they got to set up right and got rid of the corruption. The, man, the money was managed by a committee. Question is how you ensure fair use by everyone because, you know, if you got this attendant, I mean, think about this for a minute. You're in the community, you got an attendant sitting there. Let's say this attendant is your brother. You think your brother's going to give you some free water? Yep. Okay, that's corruption. Okay. Now you say, well, big deal. But you know, it depends how, how what, to what extent that goes. What if the person's whole family and friends get free things and nobody else does? Well, what that's like theft then, because then the people that aren't in that clique are paying for the services for the people in the clique, right? So this is a complicated issue. This, this corruption possibility is very real, okay? And then the other thing with these attendants, of course, I mean, this can be an incredibly boring job. This is why technology is used all the time, is to get rid of such boring jobs. Who wants to sit all day next to a pump and watch a pump operate? That's not like a good use of anybody's intellectual resources. So, you know, it can be very boring, but in some communities, it might be really welcome because you might have a trusted individual who needs a job. And they'd sit there and watch the pump. Okay, so I'm not trying to disrespect the job. I think that the job could, for some communities, have a huge value. Okay. Um, problems, reliability. Well, will the person show up for the job? I know it's the morning, everybody needs their water in the morning. And, oh, they're not here. We can't get our water. It's locked down. Ugh, ouch, the corruption problem. I think number three is a big concern because if you think about the complexity of the problem of mean time between failures and then ask what the pricing should be and then you take three of these community technologies with money users, 100 or more users, how much you should charge is a difficult thing to work out. It requires a computer algorithm to do it and to do a good job at it. I don't think a person can necessarily do it. I think a person could do it, but they'd have to be conservative. They'd have to charge too much to make sure they had enough money. The trick with automation should be that you should be able to drive prices down and still ensure a high probability of having the money on hand. Okay? That's a very challenging technological problem. Okay? Um, next. So if you have a 
management failures by the community, and you start getting a bunch of downtime, suddenly nobody trusts the system. And there's a lot of animosity in the community, right? The community isn't running the thing right, and people get upset. You know, we're talking about a very basic need of clean water. This is something to get you upset, okay? So if the, if the management, that is the people, are not doing it right, other people are gonna get very angry. All right, that's a very, that can be a tough situation. Okay, so let's go to an automated slash semi-automated management of community technology. So I'm gonna assume there's some electromechanical devices at each J, at each thing. It's gonna display the price and it's gonna gather money. Now this creates problems right here. So you think, well, you're talking about a Coke machine, right? You're talking about a machine that can take money in and give a service out. It's as simple as a Coke machine. The problem is, first assumption is that they have money. That's a bad assumption. That they have, that they have coins or that they have cash. That's not a good assumption. So it may, what, to make this work in some places, you may need a, a community a committee that will sell like tokens or trade tokens for other contributions, right? Or give out a magnetic card or something. I think that this, this, technical, this detail right here, this is a sticky one for automation. To me, this is one of the hardest problems right here. Um, next, you get a fantastic thing out of this, and that's called data tracking. So you're gonna be able to track all payments, use levels, patterns, monitoring, and do it from a distance. Dr. Bixler and his, his pumps project, he has a device hooked on to measure uh, various characteristics of the pump, make sure it's working, the water's coming out, et cetera. He sits there a little device, battery operated, guess what it does? Transmits to the satellite every night. He can look at it. We sat in the office the other day and pop open. He can look out on his laptop. Data off his pumps in Africa. Why do you care about that? Guess what? You can know whether it's working or not. I mean, if it's not working, you can say, get out there and fix this thing or whatever, okay? Um, it's also to say, to test how good of a pump it is. How reliable is it? There's a lot of reasons to get this data. Next, you might want a network. So imagine a situation, you're probably not gonna put the cell phone charging station, the toilets and the water at the same location. It might be spread around the community, right? So you might need a wireless net or wired net to coordinate all this, so you can coordinate pricing. Perhaps, but you're gonna drive cost up. I mean, you drive cost, you see, but I have to buy these like Coke machine-like controls, to get that worked out, that costs money. I just added to the cost of community technology, right? And then I gotta add a network, that's gonna cost more money. So these are the automation costs. Now the thing is, is up front, you've got those costs. There's also some ongoing maintenance costs on these things, but think about it for a minute. We are very good at the automated collection of money these days. Think about it. We do it all the time. I go out of the parking garage. You know? I mean, we do it. Coke machines. We do, we're doing more and more. We're automating that completely. Getting rid of the attendant. I mean, we go, you know, now when we go to a restaurant, you know, you have your server and they take care of it. But that's going away too, you know. Go to Chili's on 161. The tenant brings you all your food. The service waiter, waitress, whatever, brings you your food, but there's a device right on the table and you swipe your own card and handle your own payment. Okay, so it, all this money collection stuff is all being automated. And it, these are reliable collection methods. There's tons of good engineering practice on how to do this stuff. I think, though, if you took our approaches and put them in the developing world, they'd fail. They'd utterly fail. But my point is, is that we know how to approach the problem, I think we could adapt the technology, make it appropriate technology, and get it into the field. Okay. So, I think that in the end, there's probably some middle of the road solution between a full automation and a, a people method, people based management. So, it might go something like this the people attend, collect money, and get paid. So, no coin operator. You get rid of that whole having coins or dollars all together. But, have a little display there and set the prices for the person. And the person, it's visible. The attendant looks at says, you pay this much. And the, the user can look at it and say, okay, he's telling me the truth. Yeah, I have to pay that much. 
they pay that much. So the, the computer sets, handles the sophisticated pricing to make sure there's enough money to handle the problem in the meantime between failures. Okay? So if you wanted, then you could switch the system to a night operation where it went fully automated, possibly. Um, what's interesting about this case is you could cope with inequality in an in a, in a unusual way. You have pricing strategies with community input. So you could have a community board have the software GUI to the, op, the automation system, and it could pop up and have a list of all the people in the community, and it could have what their relative um, ability to pay is. And they'll know each other and say, this person's relative ability to pay is pretty low. And then they are charged less. Okay? So that could be a useful, um, useful thing. Does that happen today in, in the United States? You better believe it happens. Okay? You think that people don't get their, their, phone or their bills paid for them in various ways? It happens. Okay, so this isn't at all unusual. I mean, it, it's, it's, these are standard, standard ideas. I think it's very different. These ideas are very different in context, though. Next, uh, so feedback control for community technology management, one example. Um, let's just do a very simple example. I'm gonna take one technology, like a pump. I'm gonna take three people. I'm not gonna vary the number of people, I'm just gonna leave it at three. Uh, the notation then simplifies, since M is one, I'm just gonna have RI, um, and uh, PI, this R1 would be resource um, use um, by person one at time K. Um, PI is, well, for instance, if I is one, is the price for person one at time K. The product of the two would be how much money they spend at time K. Um, I'm going to start setting some numbers. I'm going to let, I'm going to assume that every time K, um, number person one, use five units, or two, use seven, and then eight. And then I'm gonna add on some noise because I don't know how much they're really gonna use um, uniformly distributed noise on minus two to plus two. I'm gonna say that CMK is the managed maintenance cost of time K, that's how much it costs to repair, for instance. Um, and I'll induce um, failures by, via this, uh, this variable. I'll, I'll suddenly say, oh, if it failed, you gotta pay this much to get it fixed. Once they pay it, then the thing gets fixed. Um, and then I'm going to have this is the bank. M is the bank, the maintenance money, uh, how much they have stored at any one particular time. So it goes like this the math, um, this is a lot easier to look. So let me just pick up, ignore the max thing for a minute. This is the bank. Bank of the next time is whatever our money I had in the bank at the current time, minus off what I paid for maintenance costs. Plus this, ignore the beta, let beta be one for a second. What is this? This is very easy. This is just the amount of money I get from the i person, right? Because this is their price, this is how much they got. So this is just the total amount of money I'm taking in at time k. Then I multiply by this beta, okay? Now the beta is gonna be between zero and one. Here's what I'm doing. I'm using it to siphon off money, not for corruption, but to pay the person, the attendant, okay? So I, add in this much, which is less than the total amount, and then one minus beta times that is how much money I get to pay the attendant. Okay? Very simple to say in math. Next. Then I set up an error signal, the difference between MD and M. So this is the desired stored maintenance amount. This is the one that's hard to come up with. This is the one that's going to be based on mean time between failure. You got to know how to keep that level. Okay? So that, that again, that's, and that's going to change for every technology. Okay, you do better humanitarian engine job. You make engineering job. You make your technology more reliable. You lower the mean time between failures. You lower MD, and you make it easier on the community, right? So that very clearly shows value of doing a good job as an engineer. Um, so you have this desired store of maintenance money. Um, what I'm going to do is just take MD, and I'm just going to ramp it up and help hold it to be constant. The reason I ramp it up is because it's unreasonable. I'll also, I expect the community to contribute a ton of money. I'm gonna slowly get enough money to handle failure, assuming that the failure, the mean time between failures is such that separation is way out here so that I'm gonna have ramped up the amount of money I've got and be there with enough money well before it's gonna fail, okay? Um, and then I'm gonna induce a failure at K equal 200. I'm gonna say it costs 50 bucks. Pricing signal, um, 
Wait a minute, I, I guess I should have done one more thing. On the previous slide, I didn't explain the max. What's that max thing? You gotta get used to me using these maxes all the time. It's just the crazy, stupid thing that I gotta keep money positive. That's all it's doing, it's max up to zero. I mean, that's a minus sign in the air. This is positive, these are positive, but this guy could drive it to be neg negative amount of money. No loans are allowed here. So, I've got to put a zero here, okay? There's the simple way to deal with the problem. Okay, so with the pricing signal, this is an extremely simple strategy, okay? Isa invented another one, and there's an alternative homework problem for it. Um, and uh, so, this, uh, this strategy here, um, ignore the min and the max. Just ignore that. And ask yourself what that is, right there in the middle. It's K, K positive, times E. It's a proportional controller. Remember how many times we've used proportional control in this class? Way back to the poverty app, environmental regulation, etc. Very simple idea. Think about it. If this number grows, E is bigger, okay? And so let's just say it's positive. So I don't have enough maintenance money. It's less than desired, so it's positive. If this is positive, well, this is a positive number. That means you have a positive price. Sounds reasonable. But here's the key. If M is far below MB, then that number, E, is bigger. If this is a constant. That means price goes up. So what, it makes sense, right? If I'm far from getting my maintenance thing, I charge everybody more to make sure we have enough money in time. That's the simple idea. And then the max and the min. The max just makes sure this number this number here is above zero. It has to be, it makes sense, because the price has to be positive. And then this min with this gamma says you can't charge people too much, or it's absurd, right? That's an important thing, because the community can set gamma. The community can say, we're not charging more than a penny a liter for clean water. The community can say that, guy with gamma. Okay, so this thing tries to dynamically adjust these prices to drive M to MD. Um, and uh, I want to add, add one more wrinkle. I'm not going to charge everybody the same. So I got the price. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to change the prices for each individual. I'm going to make it different. I'm going to make them PI GI times P. Where the sum of the GIs is 1. GIs are all greater or equal to 0, of course. And then, notice the interesting thing here. If I take the sum of PIs, I, I take the sum of that, that's this sum, obviously. But because the sum of the GI is equal to 1, that's P. And you say, well, duh. Well, that's important because what it says is, I'm going to take a price, and I'm going to allocate price across different people. I can pick the GI numbers. The community can pick the GI numbers. Therefore, a rich person in the community can be charged 0.9 for a G. Let's say G1 is 0.9. G2 could be 0.05. G3 could be 0.05. The poor people wouldn't have to pay much. The rich guy would have to pay more. That could be decided by the community. I'm not saying how to pick it. I'm saying the community would have to pick it. But that's what will happen in the system. It's a very simple approach to cope with the inequality. Okay? Um, and uh, one example is if you say everybody's equal, forget it. Well, GI is just 1 over N, and everybody will be charged the same thing. What happens when you take 1, I equal 1 to N of 1 over N? It's 1. All right? So it has no effect, essentially. It drops out. But in inequality, the community can pick those GIs, and you can pick them to be different. In fact, you can use a democracy to pick these GIs. Think about that, right? Yes. That, that's a homework problem. You, 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 I'm not going to assign it to you. But you could use the exact ideas from the democracy we had uh, earlier in class to pick these numbers, they evolve these numbers over time based on voting. Every time you go to the pump, you vote. I, I uh, well, you, you, you have to decide what they're gonna vote on, right? I mean, are, are you gonna, you can vote for generosity or not, right? I mean, something like that is what you could do. And you can easily constrain it so that it couldn't go haywire. The worst it could degrade to is equality. But you'd have to be careful. Because if you got 
the, the classic problem is, right, the, the, it's called, uh, in democracy, it's called the tyranny of the majority, right? The tyranny of the majority says that if everybody's voting, well, then the, the little poor guy gets screwed, right? Why? Because they all won the voting contest. So you got to set your democracy up carefully so that there's sort of a, a, a certain type of um, fairness, too. Democracy is not always fair. I mean, everybody knows that. It's not. Okay, um, let's do a few simulations. Um, and this is the code you'll work with. It's very easy to work with. Um, so I'm going to do the equality case. So with three people, that means the GIs are all one third. Okay, let's look at the, uh, the various uh, pieces. Um, so time's on the horizontal axis. On the vertical axis here, I've got RI. So this is the amount of money, no, not amount of money, amount of water or cell phone charge, whatever they're getting per day. And it's, it's random. I mean, they're getting more or less water a day or more or less whatever a day. Next, the price that they're going to be charged goes like this. These little guys, these orange hump, those are laid on top of each other, the three pricing signals for P1, P2, and P3. And then this P is the, the dashed black line is simply the sum of those three, okay? So what happens? Starts out, we don't have any maintenance money. We need some maintenance money, it starts charging. And it quickly comes up. It goes to a max. Why does it stop there? Well, because the maintenance money became MD, right where I wanted it to be, okay? And then it, uh, uh, I hope, no, no, it, 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 struck, it was headed, to, I'm sorry, I said that wrong. It, it hit the max. It hit gamma. I don't want to charge any more of that. So it takes a while for the money to accumulate then. Accumulate, accumulate, accumulate. Finally, it M gets to MD. It's zero, so prices start dropping and go to zero. Okay? And then it repeats. Okay, uh, the money I gather each time, look at these signals here, they're really noisy. That signal is the result of this signal and this signal, right? Because it's simply the product of this signal and this signal. So uh, this isn't surprising. Now, this shows uh, the money, uh, right? It's meant to be aligned with one above it. So this is MD is the red, um, and then CM of K is, is uh, the, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I said that wrong. Uh, see, M of K is the blue, and that little dot there is the, the money for repair at time 200. So I, I was trying to find a way to display it easily, okay? So I put the dot there to represent. So what happened is, is, is initially the system starts up, you have no, no maintenance money, it starts charging, charge, charge, charge. When it gets to this point, it shuts down prices. Water for everybody, toilets for everybody, right? Cell phone charge for everybody. All right, we'll come back to that in a minute. Um, and then it holds constant. Suddenly we have a failure. We lose money. You didn't completely deplete the bank. But what you do clearly is you try to build it back up because of your mean time between failure and else taught you what MD needs to be. So you build it back up. You're trying to set the rate of build up so that you'll beat the next failure, right? And then uh, it comes back up and just keeps operating like that. So the dynamics, are, are, well, they get a little sophisticated. I mean, do you see though that there's a very fundamental thing going on here with respect to feedback control, and that's how the problem's formulated. It's formulated so that the thing that's the uncertainty is like what's called a disturbance, and it can be overcome by the feedback controller. What I mean here is, what's the uncertainty here? When it's going to fail. You don't know when it's going to fail. So in the simulator, do you think it really matters if this thing bumped back to here? It doesn't matter. It will behave the same. The control system copes with the uncertainty, right? So it reacts, fixes the problem, and then if another problem comes up, it fixes the problem. It's just like cruise control going up and down the hills in southern Ohio. You don't know if you're going to go hit the next hill. The system doesn't, but it deals with it. This is exactly the same thing right here. Okay? I kept the controller very, very simple. Ease of strategy is more sophisticated. But there's other things we could do. Um, we, we were like, East and I were talking about, I was like, should we add this or this or this? And we're like, forget it, make it a homework problem. <laughs> no, 
forget it. I mean, there's, there's too much. It's a research problem. This is a research problem how to design this system. Okay, so um, there's, there's uh, quite a few issues I want to come to after the next slide about how to make the system better. Um, so for inequality, so this time I'm going to take rich guy, num is person number one, person number two, kind of wealthy, and then person number three is not so much. So 0 0.5, 0 0.3, and 0 0.2. So the way to think of that is, is if I'm charging a dollar, I'm going to charge 50 cents to the rich guy, 30 cents to the next dollar, and 20 cents to the next person. Because that's the money I need. Okay? And start the system up. Look what happens. Different prices, proportion per the GIs. Okay? And fine, this isn't surprising. Multiply this by this and you get this. This guy, what in the world did I screw up? It's the same. It is the same. Isn't it? I mean, up to some close numbers, okay? I'm, I'm exaggerating slightly. Why is it so similar? Because you, you would think that it would work worse, right? Because think about it, now I'm charging less. I mean, the poor user could be a heavy user, right? But I'm not collecting as much money from that guy. Think about it for a minute. If that's true, which certainly is going to be true, then guess what? I'm going to collect more money from the risk guy. The price, the feedback controller is going to adjust to take care of that problem. That's cool. Okay. So in the system, now I don't know in the simulator, I, I will tell you that I took several values of the GLIs and and set in and it worked. I was like, wow, this thing works. It seems to always work. I don't know. I didn't run a Monte Carlo run. I, we haven't done mathematics on this. I don't know if there's conditions on these GIs such to make this work. It, could, it is possible that you need to have not too much spread in the GIs for this to work, to always converge. But I, I just don't know. It's a, like I said, it's a research problem. Okay, there's um, a number of other problems with this system I want to highlight because I don't want to give any perception that this is like a technology ready to be deployed. Um, for instance, I, I think one of the things that's most disturbing to me is the heavy variation in the prices. I don't think that's going to be accepted by many people. In fact, in the United States, it would be accepted, would not be accepted also. But could you imagine if your electric bill, you know, fluctuated in a way that's proportional to this? You'd go nuts. Because you wouldn't be able to predict like how to budget or anything. So I capped off how much was spent for a resource, but it's pretty easy to add into this thing a cap on the rate of change. That's a common thing in engineering. You don't just cap a variable, you cap the variable of the rate of change of the variable. Uh, you could add that constraint and, and then you could slow the whole thing down. Now, of course, that's problematic because if you slow the whole thing down, um, you may not get the money in time, right? This is really becomes a challenge. Uh, you want to slow it down so you don't have much fluctuation, yet you want to charge the minimum amount of money, yet you want to make sure you have enough for the next failure. The system essentially has to figure out how to get worried. It's like, it's like Oh man, we're getting close. Failure's gonna happen. We gotta collect more money, right? That's the kind of idea you want to underlie the system. The way we approach those kind of problems in the in this with engineering is just use like a risk analysis, use stochastic processes and, and dynamical systems, and you confront these problems. This is it's not like some weird problem, it's a it's, a, it's sort of a, a standard problem. I, I think the price fluctuation in this simulation is the most problematic thing there is about this system. So I thought about fixing it, and I thought, nah, I'd rather just criticize it. I mean, in the sense that that's valuable. I mean, I think that's, that's a very important practice in engineering, to be critical of technology, and, and yet optimistic. This might have value. The second thing that bothers me about it is, is they don't understand what community it would work in. Um, and I don't think I can know that. In a certain sense, I don't have to figure that out. I'd like to know roughly where to go in the world to ask. Community, you propose this idea to them, they'll get it. It's a simple idea. You say, you want this? And they say, no, and you'll walk away. You're done. But I, I think that from things I've seen, this has potential. The way I would start with this is start on one pump. <laughs> start you know, really simple. And see if you can automate the collection of money monitoring on one pump. And see if you get that successful and then expand slowly from there 
try to understand the local constraints and context, and accept this isn't going to solve the world's problems. It's, pro it's not going to, it, it, it would have even, there's only a certain subset of communities this would work in, right? It's not going to be working in every community and the developing world. No way. But the question is, does it have enough potential to give it a go, right? That's, that's actually what's not clear to me when I talk to um, people about this. Okay, questions? I made it within one minute. All right, we'll see you.